Hi there, this is Adam Carroll, the show you end this week. And today we're going to be speaking uh, with uh, the founder and executive director of Women of the World, uh, which is an organization based in Utah that works to help forcibly displaced women make Utah their home and build community through self-reliance and trust. Um, our guest is um, also um, a, an awardee of um, uh, the uh, Nansen Awards, which is given by the UN uh, High Commissioner of Human Rights. And uh, so we're gonna be talking about her story, the stories of the women she assists, and uh, welcome to the show, Samira. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, Samira Harnish, uh, you're the founder of this organization, but I wondered if you could say a few, a little bit about the journey that took you from Iraq to Utah. Yeah, yeah, really a long journey. <laughs> I, I would love to. Um, so uh, one of the things is I wanted to mention, you know, when I was a young girl, you know, very young, uh, was 10 years old, I drew a picture of women that are trapped in a spider web, and she is sending her hand and shouting for help. So the spider web, it represents our society, that it gave a great opportunity for my brothers, but not for my sister and I. So that, um, since then, you know, always, I think, you know, one day, I will be uh, the one that to help the women from Middle East only. But of course, you know, well, um, uh, one of the uh, important things in my life to choose who do I marry, it did not happen. So I was a very young teen and I was uh, arranged marriage and came to Utah. Logan, Utah actually is uh, to go to the university. Uh, my ex-husband had a uh, scholarship to study in uh, USU. And uh, that's when uh, I told him, you know, I want my diary to study uh, engineering. So uh, that's what I did. And as a foreign student, uh, uh, it's so hard uh, uh, to get help, of course, you have to have the help only from my family to send money. And at that time, you know, it happened in 1979 when uh, the American hostage, they were in Iran and everybody thought I'm Iranian. They pushed me away and they told me go oh. home Iranian. And even the policeman that you want to trust to tell them to help me, you know, he said, well, tell me first if you are Iranian or not. And I used not to say I'm Iranian, even though I'm not, you know, and I thought, well, what make it makes different? If you are Iranian or Iraqi or whoever, you know, I, I felt it, oh, well, I thought America is the best place to go to. And now people that are judging me and my color, telling me to go home, even though they don't know who I am. And I'm giving you twice more tuition for my college than any American, you know. So I took, I had a baby when I was a baby and took my baby with me in my backpack and going to school and study and study really hard, uh, you know, at night when my kids to go to sleep. So I got my uh, degree and I, of course, it's not easy. I just want to jump from place to place to say that I got a job in one of the largest semiconductor as a, a senior engineer. I became a senior engineer by taking more classes in electrical engineer and all these things. So even when I was an engineer, you know, I saw that discrimination between the male and the female, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, that would make me more concerned one day I'm gonna be really helping uh, the women from my country. And, and that's what what's happened, you know, when I came in to Utah in 2009 in Salt Lake City, and I don't know at that time Utah very well. Uh, and so I was a volunteer as a, uh, a medical interpreter for Huntsman Hospital for the uh, for Resolment Agency and uh, taking women to go to the doctor and interpret for them. And it was kind of uh, uh, really uh, uh, amazing to hear women coming up from Sudan, Somalia, Iraq, Jordan, all those women, they speak Arabic, but different dialect. 
they asked, they said, we wanted someone to lead us. We want someone to have, you know, to give, a, to give us a voice, uh, to uh, guide us, to uh, advocate for us. And I, th I thought, they said, why you don't be one? So, of course, I, right away, I learned about the NGO and about the nonprofit uh, sector. Um, and uh, create that women of the world, you know, to help all the women, not only one women from Middle East. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's yeah. that's uh, inspiring, actually. And uh, of course, you started out as a volunteer, and now you have volunteers working with you to um, help women who have managed to come to the United States. Of course, as we all know the current administration has made that quite difficult. Yes. And uh, and the numbers are, are quite low, but the needs are still great. And I was wondering, uh, well, we can talk about your organization in a moment, but how, uh, how do you see uh, the various diverse women who are coming? Who is in Utah? What kind of refugee groups uh, are there? It's actually it's, uh, the majority, I would say, is Iraqi, uh, from Iraq, Somalia, uh, Central Africa, uh, Congo, and uh, uh, Burma. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, we don't have that much uh, uh, Rohingya. Uh, I think it's uh, in 2018, I remember, you know, we have like uh, 200 families. And I remember, you know, we have a few families that we helped. Not only the women, we have the male as well because they were injured in war. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, um, so yeah, the, 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 this is the majority. We have sixty thousand individual refugees mm -hmm. in Utah. Mm -hmm. so like yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that that of course contrasts with the over sixty. I think now over seventy million displaced people around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's such a small group that manages to come to the US. Um, the the, the uh, refugees who arrive, uh, and again, they have to be uh, let in. Uh, some of them may have open cases, some of them may have status, but um, are they uh, helped by any particular agencies? The, uh, so we have a couple uh, res resettlement agency, IRC, International Rescue Committee, and the CCS, the Catholic Community Service. And you know, uh, um, the the resettlement agency is like the other, you know, like in Utah or another state. Uh, it's uh, there is a, a, a there's a great network in and uh, of public and to provide the support, but. Unfortunately, the resettlement agency always to help uh, the refugee in the beginning, a few months with the Medicare, uh, Medicaid and with the uh, housing. But after that, you know, uh, you see they force the men to get a job and the children to go to school. And that's when the women being pushed away, stay home when we have time for you. So, um, uh, we do have agencies, like just like I said, the resettlement agency, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, we have the RSO is the refugee service office as well. You know, they help with the, any kind of uh, uh, need in the beginning. You know, when they come, but now after what after a while, they have some kind of uh, um, program to help with, to find a job and to help with the uh, apply for um, food stamp or any kind of uh, other kind of help. But uh, it's, it's all uh, like, uh, I would say, unfortunately, there is a lot of bureaucracy and there's a lot of rules. And if you do this, I will give you that, you know, something is like that. So you mm -hmm. see, they, they uh, after all they want to throw the refugee and they are in here, they're supposed to feel safe. And this is the first question, do you feel safe? And here, and is they see all these rules and the bureaucracy they have to go through. They see themselves they lost that connection with their kids 
or with, uh, to feel like safe or whatever, you know, why we, why we have to do this to find this? Why I have to work from the morning until uh, four o'clock uh, or three o'clock and after that, three hours in English class, uh, classes and I have to go to home when my kids are already asleep, you know, especially with the single mother, you know, they don't have someone to watch them, you know, that's why we have a lot of a problem to find with the kids, you know, run away from this, from the school or stealing food from the school or uh, going in, you know, um, they get in gang, gang and violent and all these things is because there's no one is watching them. You know, mm -hmm. if they have a father, you know, to watch them, and that will be great. But some of them, you know, I mean, we are dealing with, with a single mother. They have a lot of a problem with that, you know. And I really reach out to the senator many, many, many times, taking the story, taking people with me and showing me what's going on, you know, to change some of these kind of uh, regulations. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, you, that a few months of, of financial assistance is certainly insufficient for yeah. people who've been through trauma, you know, war, uh, and then trying to navigate in new cultures. And then all these rules, as you said, uh, which may be uh, in many ways confusing. Um, with the trying to advocate for these families, for the women and their families, um, you mentioned going to elected officials. What kind of um, presentations do you do? What, what do you ask for? You mean with the to advocate for the women? Uh, what mm -hmm. kind of, so we uh, we um, uh, I would say you know like uh, uh, first of all, it's really not easy you know to women to trust us and tell us about their problem and all these things. So I learned that from my experience that I wanted to listen to them to their problem, to be emotional with them and tell them yeah I think it's going to be okay. You know that's mm -hmm. when you attract that. A trust, you know, a lot of people they ask me, our organization they ask me, they said, why the women they come to you, why they trust you, that why they tell you all their story and everything. And this is the number one, you know, to listen and hear them what they are talking and to, uh, you know, to be emotional with them. So the, the we have three programs that. Um, we in our organization is uh, the first uh, program is customized service advocacy and capacity building and mm -hmm. second one economic empowerment and community development what i mean about the uh, advocacy is we we advocate for them through the immigration housing and healthcare issue it's like a, a like a, last week actually we have a woman she was injured and she has to do no i'm sorry you know she has a problem with her uh, kidney failure and she has to do a surgery but she does not have Medicaid but it was a pregnancy when she went so the med the bills came at eighty thousand mm. dollars and she does not have a job because she lost it because of COVID-19 and her husband mm. is working but part-time and so and she has seven kids and wow. how she Pay eighty thousand dollars, you know, for that. So we help them with that because we fill application to the hospital and we tell them and we show them, you know, she does not have the money to pay for for them. So this is what like. This is one of the example, you know, to say about the advocacy. With the immigration, there's many things that's happening, you know, like uh, many women they said, you know, I I cannot pay for applying for citizenship. So we are. We uh, we file uh, a waiver for their uh, for their citizenship, and we get that. You know, of course, you know there's a lot of paper working things, and we all we we do these things for them. Yeah, I, I think the amount that refugees need to pay or anyone needs to pay for citizenship has increased. Right, it's more expensive now. Yeah. But they hold on to it. You know, it's supposed to be in uh, beginning of October. Um, but they said we were yelling and shouting and everything. They said they mm -hmm. hold on now with it. They're not going to, it used to be, you know, we'll have a waiver for the applying for that. And they said they're going to put the waiver is, uh, I think it was uh, $1,500 or something like that. They said they're mm -hmm. going to put it in October. So we uh, wrote and we talked and everything. And they said, okay, they hold on to it until the next year to see how it goes because of the COVID-19, they're not going to do it this year. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I'm sure COVID-19 makes all of this much more 
difficult uh, yeah. just to reach people, to get them to go to the right um, uh, meetings. I see you're drinking from a UNHCR cup, and I'm going to have to ask you about your award in a minute. Oh, nice. but, but, uh, but but uh, I did want to ask about some of the women, maybe some more stories, um, and both about their needs, but also their resilience. Yes, yes. I think, you know, I mean, of course, in our website, and we have more in here, you know, pictures in our wall, you know, every picture, it has a story in it, you know, how they are resilient, how they are, uh, you know, for all the things they went through, you see them, they are, they wanted to do something, you know, this is their opportunity, they wanted to do something. So we, we have, uh, we've been giving a certificate, you know, for the women that reached, one of the certificates actually in the picture in there, we give a certificate for the women that reached their goals. The goals that they do like that year, either learning English, learning how to drive, and to be independent in these, in these, uh, uh, the, the aim, they aim for it and they reach to the, or to be, you know, to study, uh, Master degree, bachelor degree, the first generation to go to college, and we do have uh, anonymous women that to give uh, a scholarship for the women. So I came to this idea, you know, to give a certificate on December every December. Nine years I've been doing that. The first year I remember I gave a three um, a three uh, certificate for women. This is uh, the show that I make to make the American. Uh, and a new child to understand, to educate them, tell them, you know, who are those women and why they are getting this uh, certificate to tell a little bit about their story in that. And the women actually, they come and they speak in the microphone and they say why they received this uh, certificate. So the first year uh, I gave it three and uh, last year I gave 10 times more. It's because this uh, gave the other, uh, you know, the peers, you know, the the women that are sitting in the audience, they said, well, next year I'm going to get that organ uh, the certificate. You know, it's because, um, and the other thing is I call a woman like uh, in Utah, like the mayor, Jackie, one time I told her to come and give the certificate is because they feel that it's very happy there is someone in the government come to see them. There's American people sitting in the audience to see us, and it's a free event. Um, uh, to uh, they they get really happy to tell them, thank you so much, Utah, for giving us the opportunity to be in here. And they wanted to give back to the community by being a nurse, a doctor, and we have women, you know, engineer. That this is the the shining. Uh, time when I do that. And we have, of course, the event is for the uh, for the um, fashion show. This is the only event that I do it is uh, on uh, uh, International Women's Day. Uh, I used to do it actually as just uh, free for the people to understand. Again, education for the American people because I don't like them to come and pull the hijab uh, from the women or to, to tell them don't wear this kind of uh, uh, clothes, you know, like from Congolese or or the Central Africa, the women have been pushed away in the grocery store, and they call mm -hmm. me right away because they said this is America, you have to change that, and I do not want them to change their culture. I do love the best of their culture and the best of American culture to combine them to make them strong. So this is why I do the uh, the fashion show, but I start to do it with the uh, this is the only fundraiser to do it for. I think it's five years when I start to do the fundraiser with that. But they are so beautiful, of course, and to show not only their their beautiful culture in their clothes and their beautiful faces, they show how they are so resilient and they are learning a step one step by uh, you know one step at a time. And yeah, I, I saw that uh, you know you do a lot to empower these women and uh, there's something on your website called a ladies blog i was wondering if you could say what that is ladies blog this uh, actually one of the intern she told me can i do this uh, ladies blog you know so 
um, she met with them actually, and uh, they talk about their story. Uh, you see, uh, a lot of uh, young women they came in with their, they saw whatever they saw in their country, and being saved by either grandma or mother. Uh, only mother and without uh, dad. So when they come over here, they wanted to say something about that. They wanted to uh, tell the people how harsh they want to through and what they are doing right now. So this is actually is a new, not too long ago, we start to do that, you know, ladies o'clock, you know, we do mm -hmm. a lot, you know, like of course pod podcasts and everything and make them mm -hmm. to come and just uh, talk about uh, their, their uh, you know their challenge and how how uh, they become. Uh, how, I mean, I, I think the the I would say the one thing that I learned from them is life goes on. You know, even though they went with this horrible horrible things, war, oppression, poverty, mutilation, uh, rape, mm -hmm. and when they come in here, they said. They stand up and they wanted to work and to be in there. And I want Samira to teach me English, to go in there, to teach me the, the regulation and laws and everything. You know, mm. this is. I, I'm sure they can teach us a lot as well. And, exactly. Uh, yes. Yeah, so you're, you're letting their voice be heard with these yes. podcasts and the blogs and uh, yes. um, uh, letting them know their rights and uh, encouraging them to engage. And I hope that's reaching the whole family, the men as well, um, that message. Um, yes. yeah. And um, so um, again, about the stories, I mean, what uh, I'm sure they're all interesting, but yeah. if you can tell me a couple of stories that maybe inspire you, you know, each day. Well, I mean, one one of the story actually I uh, one of the uh, lady that you know the first uh, five years I didn't have an office so my office was my pilot and going around you know from house to house to house and the only people that were helping me is the volunteers so I remember one time I was in the uh, uh, TV and or radio and this lady she called me and she said you know I'm from Pakistan and I heard you on the TV right away I took your information and I'm calling you right now because I have a, a woman from Pakistan. She's been in here for 11 years and she has a son 11 years old and she's been beat up by her husband and the family and she does not speak English. So please, can you see her? And I said, yeah, of course. You know, so when I met her, of course, she was very skinny, uh, pale, and uh, she does not speak English except, hi, how are you, and bye. You know, so she was uh, the lady that she called me. Uh, she introduced me to Fatima, and uh, she was interpreter interpreting for Fatima about her life. And I thought, so do you know how to take a bus? She said, no. Do you go to school to learn uh, English? No. So all she did is stay home. And her son was with her at that time and telling me, my, please save my mom. So I said, well, first of all, I cannot do the separation from your husband because this is not our program. And because we have YWCA, it does this separation, you know, to separate the husband and they give her shelter and until they do her paper divorce or whatever. So that's when I took her in there, the first things. And after that, you know, of course, she learned English. You know, we call it the practical English. She wanted to speak English right now, you know, to get a job or um, to go to school and ask about her son, how he's doing to school. So this is the practical English that we create in our organization. So she learned English and we got her a job. And, mm -hmm. and she said, I really wanted to have my, op my own apartment. And she got her own apartment. And I remember um, when I saw her, you know, I mean, she was so happy that she said, look, I make it. I, I have my own check. You know, I have my own apartment. Mm -hmm. I want you to come to visit me, you know, to see my apartment. I want to cook for you. And when I went in there, you know, I mean, you see her, she is so, it's just like a bird was in a, a trap and now it's a family. You know? So yeah. it's, it, it was so amazing, you know, to, I, just crying from happiness, you know, and learn, and she's taking the bus, 
you know, and now she's taking her, you know, a citizenship. And because she didn't have any paper that to go and visit her mom in Pakistan, she didn't stay here forever, you know. Mm -hmm. And when she, last year, she did not only go to Pakistan, she went even to Mecca to take her mom in there and to visit oh, Mecca. Isn't that amazing? You know, I mean, it's really, you know, from 11 years living in her, in that captive uh, a place, mm -hmm. that, and now she is a free woman, you know. Uh, That's wonderful. Wonderful, yeah, and and it's a reminder that you know of of, uh, well that this is how it should be that we help each other. Um, exactly. you know, I'm thinking now of of all the controversy, uh, not just around immigrants in general, which we have in this country, but we have in so many countries now, right? Yes. Um, yeah. And uh, but also, unfortunately, in France, where there's been some violence. You know, but it's a cycle of violence. It's a cycle of, of people feeling repressed and then lashing out in a terrible way, maybe a terrorist way. Um, but then there's all these rallies now and boycotts against President Macron because he's being very heavy handed. But and yet the violence is continuing. And, and instead of this dynamic, which is so destructive, why not choose neighborliness? Why not choose to help each other? Exactly. Uh, Exactly, uh, exactly. Um, yeah. Now, Utah, I've been there once, and I, I think of it as a very Mormon place. Um, yeah. And and I was wondering what role do the Mormon uh, community leaders play, or the Mormon community in general? What Do they get involved in resettlement? They don't get involved with the early settlement, but they do get involved with donation and uh, mm. respecting them and all these things. You know, I mean, uh, the, the first time, actually, I will say the truth, you know, when I came to Utah and knocked the door and people telling them, you know, uh, we have a woman, they need to go to school. I, I don't have money for them, you know, to help them or women that they wanted to uh, uh, get to, to learn English and they have to pay for it, you know. So our organization helping not only refugee, we help asylum seeker and DECA and uh, international women as well, you know. So we are different than another organization. So we don't get uh, the fund from government. So I go and I ask, you know, please, I wanted a class for them. I want this and this. And they always ask, you know, what's a, why women? Why don't let them to stay home and take care of their kids and and uh, mm -hmm. you know this way you know so I thought well no they uh, they're single mother and there's a mother they wanted to help their husband because their husband uh, with, with their little English they don't get a good job to pay for the bills and everything so I explained mm -hmm. them for them you know and uh, uh, I did find some uh, uh, people that stand up against me to tell me so what do what we get back, like, can we convert them to Mormonism? So, and I said, no, you know, I'm not gonna do this. You know, we, we do not ask about religion. We don't ask about uh, what um, politics. We don't ask about these things. We always see a, a human being in the front of us. They need help, and we help them. This way, I do that. So, um, after a while, it changed. You know, and I will tell you seriously. I couldn't make it with a, you know, five years in my car. I cannot do it by myself. You know, many women, they call me here and there. So the they volunteer is number one, I would say, number one state in the whole world is Utah. Mm -hmm. They love to volunteer. They love to come and help with their women issues or, you know, so I, just like I said, you know, it's really hard for me. I don't have money. I don't have an office. I don't have anything except volunteers. They will come and go, you know, they come back for a month, you know, for uh, two or three hours a week and they go and they come back more, you know, so it's really amazing. When mm. uh, the retired women, they always, they love to stay with me uh, with volunteering always. Uh, the donation is that is in their religion, they give, you know, so from food, uh, um, you know, like from clothes, uh, um, any kind of need in the house, they love to give, you know, I mean, uh, again, without them, actually, I couldn't survive, you know, because there's many needs with books and jackets and you know, and here it's so cold, you know, and it's not it just a week ago, it was snowing in here. So, I mean, it's really uh, very uh, um, 
very warm this way, you know. Mm. And uh, to tell you, we have 60 uh, active volunteers that they do mentor one on one with the women to be friends mm. with them. You know, this mm. is what I tell them always they are our new neighbors and we want to welcome them. You know, you're going to learn a lot of this. And instead of going to their country, they are in here and you're going to learn more from culture, from, uh, you know, it, it's more stories, stories to give some, uh, what they call it, some encouragement that to stay uh, alive and to work and it's okay, we have this hardship. We're going to go on with that, you know. So it's really, um, they are really a great uh, people to be with uh, now, and especially when uh, when the president came and said no for Muslim, uh, is they went crazy. I mean, from the their prophet, and uh, the phone was ringing on me. You know, you know, day and that was when when the Muslim ban was announced. Yeah, and, the Muslim and ban. So they, I'm glad to hear that they were uh, yeah. uh, really against that. Yeah. Oh my gosh! Yes, you know, I mean, yeah. we were like ten, uh, I remember ten thousand uh, march to the capital, and mm. so I I was one of the speaker actually there too, and mm. there there were really uh, hard, and they start to give and give and give, you know, mm. and, you know, just uh, to, um, that's a change a lot. For that's very reassuring about uh, humanity or, or anyway, basic decency. Uh, we're going to take a really short break. Uh, not uh, Don't go away, uh, but we'll be right back for station identification. This is Adam McCarroll with the UN This Week. And this is Adam Carroll back with Samira Harnish uh, from uh, Women of the World talking about uh, women refugees and their resilience and the wonderful programs that her organization is, is helping with. Um, and uh, before we talk about the UNHCR on your mug and on your medal, um, I did also want to ask you specifically about the Burmese community in Utah because of course we, our NGO runs Burma Task Force and we're interested uh, in the diaspora, uh, in their needs. And I was wondering if they have any different needs or are they pretty much the same as other immigrant groups or refugee groups? I will, I will say it's the same, you know, because the, uh, one of the things is, you know, I um, kind of, uh, um, you know, you know, of course, you know, the, this is, is everywhere, you know, when the refugee, they come and they sign for um, um, for apartments. I remember, you know, um, one of the family I visited, you know, and they know I'm Muslim, so they, you know, read the Quran together and all these things, you know, so they were really happy to um, visit always. They want me to be in there. And I remember, you know, um, uh, there, there apartment you know has more to the wall you know to the ceiling and i went and i asked uh, the landlord to go and do something about it because they have a kid is has asthma and mm. i said Please, you know i want you to clean up you know their wall because it's really not good for them and especially there are six living in two bedrooms in uh, and mold and mold is reach out to their bed and everything and i remember you know of course you know it happened many times you know too it's not because they are uh Rohingya or anything you know but they you know she yelled at me and she said uh, this is the way they like it you know that's why you know their food, their, you know, the way they lived in their camp and everything, you know, they like whatever they do and they destroy my wall. Now they have to pay a thousand and a thousand dollars for that. So I took a picture with my phone and I went and I to the health department and I said, this is the way it is. And this is the woman. She told me like that. And they came right away to her house and talked to her about it. You know, so I think it's a, one of the things, you know, they, mm. they think is Burma, other Burmese, Korean, Ukraine, and uh, Rohingya, their food, it caused the mold on the wall. And the food I, caused the mold. Okay. 
because <laughs> the team, because there is the team is coming and all these things, you know. And I thought, huh. where did this come from? You know, I mean, come yeah. on, let's educate you some more from them. Come, mm. let's just see their food and everything. It's because the apartment is so small that because there is no window, sometimes it's open, and they do leave the door open actually sometimes when I go to visit them. So I mm. said, what did you, so this is the mentality they think is the Burmese, their food is steaming or something like that. And that will cause it. You well, know, it so. might be delicious too, but um, I, I suppose <laughs> it's it smells differently and, and they don't know how to react to that. And smell yeah, is yeah. sort of a really basic, you know, well, thing, you react to it. So loser. But, but, yeah, but hopefully uh, they'll learn to uh, yeah. a, appreciate each other. Um, so, all right, you've been doing this now for a number of years. How many years now? This, uh, and this year is 10 years. Yeah. 10 years. Yeah. What, Congratulations. What Thank yeah. you so much. So a couple of years ago, uh, somehow the UN found out about you and gave you an award. How did that happen? So I, I think it's one of the... Um, uh, no, I think she is. After that, I found out one of the volunteers that, you know, she wrote about me and all these things. And uh, mm. I, I didn't know anything about the Nansen Award at that time. And when I got a call from, oh, someone actually sent me uh, an email telling me the um, United Nations from Washington, D.C. or from New York, I don't remember. It said, they're going to call you on Monday at this hour. Are you free? And I said, yeah, sure, I'm free. So um, I, my heart was beating up and all these things. My, my dream when I was young in Iraq, I always say, one day I'm going to go to the United Nations and to be a part of them. And I need to help the, all the people around them bring the peace, to be humanitarian. So I always say, say that. And my mom, she always shout at me and tell me, just be quiet, you know. So, I mean, when, when they, they told me like this, and I said, okay, I have to remember when this person is calling me, I'm going to hit recorder in my, my phone because I don't know why they are calling me. Maybe I don't get it, you know. And I did hit the recorder on my phone. And the gentleman told me, you know, hey, do you know you are one of the uh, award, uh, you know, for the Nansen Award? And I said, oh, excuse me? Uh, was that? So he explained for me was the Nansen Award and all these things. And after that, you know, he said, we, we have 450 people that apply for it from all over the world, but we chose only five, one from each continent. And you are mm -hmm. a continent of Americas. And I thought, what? I just started to cry, 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 sobbing, you know. I couldn't say anything for him, but he is talking, talking to me. And he said, yeah, well, we're going to celebrate uh, in October, but don't tell anybody about that until we have it on uh, their website and everything. And until they send someone from the United Nations to come to my office, he called it his, uh, what did he call it? He said uh, the headquarter. And so I don't know how many people they work in there and everything. And I thought, well, we have only two case manager and I, you know, we don't have headquarter, you know, that to work in here. So they, they sent someone, gentlemen, to come and do video for us and met with the women. And so my, uh, at that time, you know, I have uh, office already, you know, because I told them, you know, they told them, yeah, the a young lady that she applied for that for me, you know, she wrote about me. She said she's still working from her uh, pilot, you know, car. So they came in and they took that video and went in October 1st, you know, when we celebrate in Geneva. And of course, I met a lot of amazing people in there. And I just cry, 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 because uh, this is my hope. One day I'm going to go to the United Nations. I really always wanted to be a part of it you know i am a part of it if i'm doing you know yes work, you know? <laughs> but. well without what you're doing in the grassroots level uh un would just be a lot of talk frankly so i, I think it's really important and i'm really glad that your your efforts were recognized and also they're recognized by the women themselves which is yeah. very clear yeah. Uh, yeah. who look so beautiful on your website it's really Thank very very lovely and um so um just um we're getting uh people responding from different uh, places uh, here on the screen which is nice um and uh so 
how can people assist your organization? Can, do you take donations? Yes, we do, of course. You know, I mean, with the with the COVID nineteen, unfortunately, we lost a lot of funding. You know, for this year, and uh, just like I said, we don't take uh, uh, government funding, uh, just private sector and. Uh, companies and all these things. We do take a donation, uh, mm -hmm. of course, um, for uh, for giving a scholarship for the women that um, the first generation to be in there. And just like I said, because the asylum seeker in the uh, international student and DECA, they don't have, they don't get any help from government. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we have been giving, you know, if you see the scholarship that we give, uh, thank God, to, from one of the uh, a lady that anonymous in Oregon, she's mm -hmm. been sending, you know, money uh, for three years now. The first uh, year, she just wanted to see if it's going to work or whatever, you know, when she's read the essay and everything, she cried, you know, and I... We she never did meet those women, you know, too. And we wanted to do some kind of celebration one day to meet them because they, um, this is really a great, you know, uh, of course, you know, for if we get this money and uh, to give those DACA students and make them to finish their degree and mm -hmm. help them, you know, to um, their future, you know, because they are going to give back to the community. That's what they are always, they tell me, you know. Um, yeah, I don't know what kind of donation they are thinking about, but uh, this is a donation we are asking for. Most of the time, I don't want to take any used clothes or used shoes or whatever, you know, because they are, they have a dignity, they have a, mm -hmm. a pride and dignity, you know, on them. And uh, why we give them something is used, you know. So mm -hmm. I uh, came to uh, to tell everyone, if you wanted to give something, give it a gift certificate, like from these places mm -hmm. like the Walmart, uh, any places that they have clothes, they go by themselves. First of all, it's not going to be hard for us to see who fit it. And what and what kind of clothes they they like or color is better to give them a gift certificate. They feel uh, more um, uh, happy to go take their case and let's go and choose whatever you want and the size mm -hmm. they want. You know, so the gift certificate is really going really great. And thank God for the uh, community around us. I speak a lot in here in. Uh, uh, tum in in uh, uh, churches or school and everything, and this is they know that it's time not for a hat or a ripped hat or smelly hat or a boot with a hole or <laughs> like, that, like that. You know, I mean, I throw them in the garbage. I don't want to give it to them. You know, so yeah, we need of to course. Yeah, well, people can go to your website and, yeah. and figure out how to help and to uh, donate, and if they're in Utah, to volunteer. And um, really, this is a great service. And thank you. Um, I hope that COVID nineteen pandemic will, you know, not make any of you sick. But I'm sure it's all around. It, uh, yeah. Rates have been high recently in Utah. Uh, I hope your ladies are keeping healthy. Inshallah. Yeah, it's actually a month ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got uh, COVID nineteen a month ago. Oh. Because, well. Even though I wear, we met, wear mask and everything, and with the cleaning and all, all these things, but uh, and you know, fortunately, I got it mild. But of course, mm. yeah, we do have some ladies because one of the hardest things is that they don't have laptop for their kids. To be on the computer, I mean, to be taking classes on the laptop uh, mm. than the school. So that brought the uh, COVID 19 to them. And we are always taking, you know, sanitizer and cleaning and food for them, you know, to, to uh, deliver the, for, you know, for those family they have it. Yeah. Hopefully it goes from all over the world, you know, all. All the world, you know, hopefully, and especially, you know, the camp and all these places where the more people together in there, you know, I hope we pray for that to mm. be one day with the um, this vaccine. I mean, I'm sorry, the find the vaccine and this disease goes away. Yeah, all those people in those crowded camps everywhere. It's uh, really something to remember. 
Yeah. So we have to finish, but it's been a pleasure to speaking with you. And uh, also, um, I, I hope that um, people will want to support your work. Thank um, you. And that the antibodies will protect you going forward, yeah. hopefully, and, and, God yeah. that, and that God will protect you as well. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you all uh, uh, to the viewers. And, and we'll see you the next show. Uh, this is Adam Carroll with UN This Week. And remember that we are having a fundraiser for Justice for All coming up shortly on November 21st. Um, and hopefully you can uh, join us then as well. So thank you, everybody. And goodbye.